Warren, thank you very much for coming by today. Hey, it's my pleasure. It's good to be back with the team here. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, uh, you know I, I know I just told you this in the other office, but I want to say it again for these folks. Uh, you know, uh, as I look back at, the, at my entire body of work, and particularly the Ultima series, the Ultimas that I'm the most uh, proud of, and I in particular had the best uh, story craft that I look back on and go, man, do I really wish, I hope I could do that again. Those are the games I made with you, uh, and they were there when you were the you know the producer on the game and uh, also the story collaborator on the games as well. Uh, I just really look super fondly back at that period of time we had to work together. Well, I, I do too. I mean, I, I think maybe you're selling Ultima 4 a little short there, but uh, working with you on Ultima 6 was an education. I, mean, I came in uh, from TSR thinking I was the, the interactive guy. I mean, I really came in thinking, I'm going to show these guys what interactivity is all about. And it took me about 10 seconds sitting with you to realize I knew nothing. And so uh, I, I, I remember uh, sitting at your house, uh, eating Chinese food. I bet you don't even remember it. You know, you showing me the black book and explaining how the yeah. black book works. There they are right there. There they are. And uh, sitting there working with you on the story for Ultima 6 and getting uh, a graduate ed education in, in game design. I mean, uh, it, was, it was an amazing and humbling experience. You know what's interesting about the speaking of those black books, which is um, I, uh, I was just showing, I, I think I had uh, on one of my earlier little video blogs we did, uh, uh, I went all the way back to the original story of Mondane the Wizard I wrote in high school, <laughs> and I noticed at the back of this linear story that I've written, I had effectively that little black book, the sort of matrix of yeah. here's the characters, here's the towns, here's the events, and the, you know, each on a different page. Um, you know, here's the magic items and how they flowed through the story, and and so this kind of matrix design of story, I don't know where I got it from. I mean, I, I interpret it as what you know. What Tolkien may or must have done, or I don't, I don't know if normal writers writing normal books. You know more normal no. writers than I do. Uh, I've so, never uh, heard at that point. I had never heard to this day. I've never heard of anybody doing it that huh. way. Uh, honestly, I've tried. I can't even duplicate it, but mm -hmm. it sure works for you, and it sure it works for the Ultima games. Yeah, and 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 I've already started that. I've already literally. You know, we're all doing things digitally these days. Yeah. I, I the last purchase I made on Amazon was a the old-fashioned spiral-bound paper notebook with five cardboard get sections so that I can start my black book for this game to, to have that multi-threaded uh, sort. What, whatever works for you, yeah. you know? whatever yeah. works. You know, yeah. it's, it, it was a revelation to me, it really was. And uh, I, I remember that time uh, at least as fondly as you do, that's for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, well, uh, anyway, I still appreciate it. So, I, uh, so, I'm, so I'm hopeful, of, and what, I, what I've tried to tell these guys uh, with regularity of the game, uh, that you've just seen a little tiny piece of here, but in Shroud of the Avatar, what I'm hoping we can do is, uh, you know, is, is to create a story-driven solo player experience that harkens back to somewhere between Ultima 4 and Ultima 7, yeah. uh, but that also has the ability to play online uh, sort of with an, an opt-in method or an opt-out, depending on where you, where you start, uh, as to how multiplayer you want that to be, you know, mm -hmm. how, uh, you know, whether you want it to be, you know, how close to an MMO you want it to be, or whether you really just only are interested in your actual friends and family, so hey, that, that sounds great. I mean, it, it, when you pull that off, it'll be pretty amazing, you know. I've, I've always had, just personally, a little problem with the, the, the traditional MMOs and that I don't want to be surrounded by 10,000 of my close personal friends, and there really hasn't been something that lets me experience the, the real role playing, I guess, that, that I feel when I, when I sit down with five or six of my close, my genuine close personal friends, right. uh, and you know me, I mean, I'm a single player guy. So anything that lets me decide tonight, I feel like, or right. uh, this is the kind of experience I want to have, that'd be really powerful. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. As I, you know, uh, I can't remember if you've even heard me give this particular talk, but a talk I've given over the last couple of years, uh, which is sort of coming back to haunt me. Uh, <laughs> Don't because they of, all? Because of because of the implication of it, and uh, that, that I'm now having to kind of uh, reinterpret or explain. As to why, how I think about it now, you know, I look back at you know uh, quote solo player games, which often sell millions of copies, oh, yeah. to quote MMOs, which often sell tens of millions of copies, and you go, and they're more expensive and they're more complicated. It's the only real reason that could be true is because you're playing with other people, right. and then you look at quote social games like Farmville's or whatever else, and they sell often to a hundred million people, and uh, and I, and it's not because of the pestering you for microtransactions or spamming your friends. 
It's because we, they've invented a, a respect for your friends graph. And instead of playing with the 10,000 strangers, you're actually connecting to the one or two or five people that you go to the movies with or go out to dinner with, even if you're not online at the same time, often with some asynchronous behavior. Right. But if you look at UO, uh, you know, you weren't online all the time anyway. It was your, it was your vendor, you know, who was online um, uh, instead. So I'm, I'm, that's what gives me hope that I think we can create a game like this, Shroud of the Avatar, where uh, I can create a story and then create the ability for you to open your world to at least your friends, the ones you do care about. Well, that's, as many more as you want. That's the other thing. I, I, I know, I mean, we've known each other a long time, and uh, I know how much you respect story. And that I think will set you apart in the world of MMOs too. I'm sure the Avatar is going to tell a great story. I know it. Well, I know why, it's do you, why, why do you think that uh, you know? As I look at our industry, you know, I, I've told a story something uh, like you know, every time there's a technological reset, you know, CD drum drives, hard drives, even before that, um, uh, 3D render hardware, gameplay sort of resets back to a first-person shooter <laughs> again. I think. And so, uh, you know, I'm often wondering for, you know, I know you obviously are a huge story crafter yourself. Oh, uh, why are there so few of us who are interested in, in story crafting games? Is it, does it just not pay well? Well. Uh, is it too hard? I, I think, I think it's, it's all of those things. It's that, uh, you know, making a really interactive story is really hard. I mean, that was one of the reasons uh, I said you, okay, let me back up a step. When you were working on Ultima 5, that was when, uh, you know, I, I realized I've got to work with this guy. Uh, we were at uh, Armadillo Con, tiny mm -hmm. little science fiction convention in Austin, Texas. We were on a panel together. I don't even remember, remember what panel it was. And you started describing what you were doing in Ultima Five, uh, in terms of the story and really playing a role, and uh, the, you know the, the virtues and, and living up to them, and showing you the consequences of what happened when you didn't. And I just said, that's that's what I that's what I do every day in mm -hmm. in sort of tabletop role playing. Uh, and when we worked together in Ultima Six, uh, there was. I, I just, it became clear instantly that what you were trying to do was let players actually tell their story. You know, it was, it was less important that there was this story arc that you had created than it was that every player could sort of make their own one, you know? And I think Ultima Online had a lot of that, but uh, I, th I think there was so much focus on the social in that game that uh, I don't think you could really get at the story you Well, wanted. yeah, and, and the, the problem with, U, with UO, uh, the, the blessing and curse of yeah. UO was that the non-combat roles became so popular and, and so difficult to maintain that that really is what the game became about. Uh, and even though the virtues were sort of there as a veneer, yeah. uh, and uh, there really was no story driving you through it by any means. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but if you go back again to Ultima 5, and some of those, some, even and before, and after, I think, well, I mean, a bunch of those around there, we would simulate a party. You know, we, would, we invented oh, sure. these companions sure. to go along with you. Just you had a, a foil to your, uh, yeah. your, your, what you brought to the game personally. And so, uh, you know, maybe, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm interested to experiment here with this one. I don't think we'll give you an AI companion party like we did in, you know. You don't need it. Th during those. But we might let you either, A, play with your real friends if yeah. you would like to. And there's even some discussion, so this is not a commitment, this is a uh -huh. discussion we're having as to whether maybe you can you know, check out, you know, take, if, if you're offline, I can still go over to your house, see your NPC there and go, hey Warren, the NPC, since you're not online right now, go, you know, go, go. come with me. Go, go, go. Do you like that? I like it. It's, it there's some risk with that, but yeah, it's a cool idea. It's um, optional, we'll see. No, but I think, I think uh, it's very hard to tell an interactive story. I mean, it's, if you look at the best stories in games, it's not like this is any great insight. They're the ones that are most like movies and that the player has the least control over. Um, you know, it's funny, when, uh, whenever anybody comes to work with me, I, I always tell them, what we do here is harder than anything you've ever done. It's harder than you think it is. And it's not like it's the not stuff playing games for a living. Yeah, that's for sure. But uh, even if you've worked on games for 10 years, trying to tell stories where players actually have some control over what they can do, where every object in the world is usable in a way that makes logical sense, which is something I got right mm -hmm. from you. Mm -hmm. um, that's really hard. It's a lot of work, and uh, most people don't think it's worth the effort. But I know it is. I know I it's worth the effort. I know. Yeah. I've, I've just seen the power of, of player-driven stories, uh, and in fact, uh, the the first time I saw that was on Ultima Six. This I don't know if, if you know about this either. Uh, I was watching one of our testers play one day, um, and. Uh, you know, it's funny. These are all vivid memories for me, and I just have no idea if you even have well, any memory let, at all. Let me know. And I'll okay. tell you. But I remember when we were working, at, <coughs> at, I remember being at your house with a black book and, and working on the Ultima Six story and, and missions and quests and all that. And uh, 
it was so primitive back then that basically it was let's design two puzzles to solve every every problem instead of right. having a, a puzzle that has one solution we're so forward thinking that we're gonna let right, so players there's decide two yeah. there's always two but there was one where we didn't think of a second solution. Do you remember what that was? Oh no, I do remember that we. I do. I remember the whole session. I remember the black books out. I remember thinking of. We always wanted to make sure there was at least two. Okay. Ones. I don't remember. Here we go. Had one that only had one. There was one. It was. Um, there was a portcullis, and there was a lever on the other side of the portcullis. The players came up this way. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. the party comes up this way. Yeah. And you needed the telekinesis spell to, to, flip, to flip the, the lever. lever, right? Okay. I do remember that. And I watched. I don't know if I should name him on on video here, but one of our testers, who you would know very well, got up to that portcullis and didn't, didn't have a telekinesis spell. So I said, <laughs> you know, that was the one where we couldn't do anything. Okay, yeah. but he's he's hosed. But uh, he had Sherry the Mouse in his part. And the portcullis uh, didn't come all the way to the, the ground. Right. It was simulated, and I use the term loosely, just well enough that he had Sherry the Mouse go under the portcullis, stand yep. next to the, the lever, and flip it. Right. And it didn't break the game. Right. I fell to the floor yeah. and said, the rest of my life, I'm going to be doing that on purpose yeah. and not by accident. Right. So uh, player-driven stories, really hard. You know, right. doing that in a simulated environment, right. you can't really do it in a scripted environment, but doing it in a simulated environment, that is really freaking Well, hard. you know, I don't know. I think, I think one of the reasons why I... I became so fascinated and, t and terrified with that as a goal. Goes back to how people used to always try to kill and su often successfully kill Lord British. You know where uh, uh, you know I remember one case uh, or two that I'll throw out. You know one was uh, if you in Ultima three or four if you if you hit Lord British he would come kill you. But as as long as you were far enough away when you shot him or whatever he would run at the same speed as you so you could run out of the castle over the moat jump in a ship that for some reason I thought I should put in the moat because it's just for looks. When you jumped in a ship, you could then move one square offshore so Lord British can now not get to you. And then you could use your ship's cannons to shoot Lord British. And even though Lord British was immortal, the cannons didn't do damage. They just rolled a coin toss, 50-50 chance that oh, thing you shot at is dead. And so, you know, after a few shots, you'd kill Lord British. <laughs> or uh, another one where uh, uh, next game I made Lord British immortal. Uh, but uh, there were the, it was when we put schedules into the world and Lord British would occasionally go to sleep. And when he's asleep, there was only one icon for sleeping characters, including Lord British. So while he's asleep, he's not Lord British. He's a sleeping character, according to the damage routine. And so we could kill him in one oh, blow. Right. Nightmares that we created by creating these systems that oh, allow this. You know? But that's, you know, I, I always say what, what for other developers is a bug is for us a feature. Right. You know, I mean, I've, I've worked on games, uh, which I will not name, where uh, players figured out how to do all sorts of stuff that we never intended them to do. And we knew that no matter how hard we tried, they would figure out how to get out of the world. They would just figure it out. So outside of the game maps, we would put crates and ladders and things so you could stack up crates and get back into the game. Back because, in. Yeah, 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 it wouldn't yeah. break anything. So, right. uh, but, but again, it's, <coughs> it's so hard. It's easy to, to imagine a story in a movie or in a cinematic adventure, or in a world where the only choice you get to make is which gun do I use to kill that. Thing. Right. But if you're making a world, I mean, what was that, what was that motto? Let me think. Uh, <laughs> we create, what was it? Yeah, worlds. And do you remember who came up with that? Uh, no. Robert. Ro I know. That it, is we've, the, talk, we've talked about it on camera here before going like, that was like Robert's like moment of creative brilliance. That's the most profound creative thought I can imagine. It's, it's actually one of the best things ever about Origin. Absolutely. And uh, and Robert, who it was rare to come up with great creative ideas, that's was his contribution. So well, it, it, it was it's his proudest moment of, of creative contribution. You know, at, but every every place I've worked since, I've I've tried to make sure that we have um, a, a statement. I mean, you know, mission statement is such a cliche, but but that that one line mm -hmm. summed up everything that I thought was important about Origin. We create worlds, yeah. uh, and we tell stories in those worlds, and we let players contribute to the telling of those stories. And it didn't matter if it was hard. In fact, the fact that it was really hard was the reason to do it. You know, uh, and I've I've just adopted that. Well, how how have you found like you know when we uh, were growing Origin in those earlier days here in Austin? Yeah. Uh, Austin was sort of uh, you know the third coasty kind of backwater of game development that we sort of still are in a way, sadly. <laughs> 
Uh, we have thousands of people. I mean, no, no. But what I mean is, uh, you know, we keep losing our losing jobs oh, and yeah, things yeah. to as, as California companies acquire our local developers. And that's why we need and, to be self-sustaining. Uh, we do need to be self-sustaining. Yes, please. Uh, but uh, but every time a California company buys us and then dumps us, uh, you know, we, we, we the whole city kind of hurts yeah. simultaneously. That's true. Uh, but back in those earliest days, as we were teaching the local rock and roll poster artists to become computer artists. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, and technical design assistants were invented to help us, uh, uh, you know, create these worlds. Um, it was also what I'll call a cheaper, easier, simpler time. Uh, and so, how are you? How are you finding it? I mean, uh, you know, you, you've you've recently come off a big, it's pretty darn big games. So oh yeah, they were uh, fairly deep. Uh, and so, uh, you know, you think you can sustain your devotion also to this, uh, you know, deeper reality crafted. You know, well, I think worlds. you know it, it's tough. I got to say, the AAA game space these days is is a pretty tough place to be. Um, and I think one of the ways we can avoid some of the pitfalls of the you know two, three, four, eight hundred person team is to to you know stick with more iconic graphics. You can you can make an absolutely beautiful game. I mean, I'm not saying that's what you're doing, no, no, no. but but I think one of the reasons we're able to do things less expensively. Uh, and and still achieve the level of depth is we focused on gameplay more than anything else. We we built simulations, not elaborate scripts that can break all the time. I mean, and there's there's a certain economy to that. But again, though, we we didn't try to make something that looked exactly like the real world. Mm -hmm. We were we were making things that, that matched mm -hmm. what we saw in our heads and our imaginations. Here, here's something I find too. I'm curious if if you do too. I mean, in um, yeah, back in the origin days, for sure. You really couldn't go buy the proverbial camera uh, off the shelf, uh, and even, even and even though there have now been three D renderers of very high quality for me the last decade, they didn't usually come with development environments and the world building tools to back it up to be a place you could just grab it, import it, use it like you could in the movie industry after thirty years of the movie industry. Uh, but I think we're now past that. I actually think you know we're really happy with this engine, and you know, we were talking about engines earlier. I mean, we, we yeah. both seem to have discovered that. The, the tools are now available to where you can kind of skip the first two years of development if you pick the right tool base to build on top of. I, you know, I remember the, literally my first day at Origin. Uh, I remember walking into uh, Dallas Snell's office and and saying, you know, looking at what you guys were doing on Ultima 6 at that point, your very early work on Ultima 6, and I think, why don't you release your tools? I mean, I just come from from you know Dungeons and Dragons land. And I knew that there were game masters out there who would love to build stuff in that tool set. And I said, why would we put any effort into polishing up those tools and making them available to people? No one would ever want to build. And I, I said, oh, well, okay. And yeah, in but retrospect, I, but I think I was right. Look well, at what people are doing. There are now tools that are probably except, that anybody Except, do you remember when we made these games over right over here? Vaguely, yes, and, I remember. Uh, if you remember how hard it was to extract this game's code out yes. of that game's engine? Yes, I do. I, and, I'm painfully aware of that. And so, uh, you know, I think unless you start with the idea of building a tool, as a tool, it's pretty hard to. I'm not saying that was the wrong decision yeah. back in 1989, but, but clearly, but there the time are clearly, has come. yes, there are clearly yeah. engines now that. I mean, when you have six-year-olds building game content in uh, in certain game engines, you know, uh, we're we're in a whole new world, and I think that certainly allows us to do things more quickly and and uh, with less expense, which means we can generate more content that people can enjoy. Yeah. yeah. Well. Thank you, sir. You know, uh, I, again, I, I would like to uh, circle back to end up with the, sort of where I began and just say, uh, you know, it's really been a joy and privilege to work with you off and on down through the years. I sure hope that our professional paths uh, uh, stay parallel and periodically intersecting, and uh, you know, I hope to uh, drag you into at least play and, uh, <laughs> I and maybe you give you a little advice uh, here I on Shroud of the Avatar. Try, try and stop me. Try Perfect. and stop me. Thank you so much. Sure.